I am going to name names, yeah. Okay, and I think more people will join us as we come along, but um, I think the snow has, uh, has, has somehow scuppered travel um, efforts. Great. So let's get started. Um, hello, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome from myself as coordinator of the Eclipse Project and everybody else on the Eclipse team. Um, so my name is Juliet Young. I coordinate, I have the great pleasure of coordinating the Eclipse Project, and I am really delighted to see you all here today because we've been talking about and working on this conference for a very long time now after a wonderful suggestion from our strategic advisory board to hold this conference a year before the end of the, the project in order to really showcase what Eclipse has done and what we can all do together to make the rest of the project and the future mechanism as worthwhile um, as we possibly can. So we've got a very busy agenda for the day. Um, and you'll see that what we've done is that we've tried to add quite a lot of different activities throughout the day to really make this um, as interactive and fun as we possibly can and really trying to build on all of our joint uh, experiences and knowledge. Before I hand over to our first speaker, just a few housekeeping um, issues. Um, so, in case of a fire, an earthquake, or other calamity, um, don't follow me, because I'm probably going to be freaking out over here somewhere. But do, please, very calmly, walk down the very large red stairs. There's a sort of VIP exit for us today. Um, and, and just leave the building calmly and quietly. Um, the toilets are also downstairs, so don't get confused on your way out. And actually, it's, it's under the stairs that the toilets are, and that's where you left all your coats and everything else, so that's fine. Phones. Normally, we ask people to turn their phones off, but in this case, as with everything in Eclipse that's slightly different, um, we would ask you to just put your phones to silent because we're going to be using um, a software called Mentimeter throughout the day, and Marie will explain to us later on how we're going to use it. But basically, it allows lots of interaction during the day. So we're going to ask you lots of questions via this software, and you can answer via your phone, just to make things a bit more fun. And the Wi-Fi codes and Mentimeter codes are all on the top of the agenda that you've got in, and here's the prop, in your little registration bags. Now, you will see, first of all, that the registration bag is not an Eclipse bag, it's a Center for Ecology and Hydrology bag. And that's because I work for the Center for Ecology and Hydrology bag, and C8 had a huge amount of spare bags. And with Eclipse, as with everything we do, we believe that bags, just like knowledge, should not be duplicated or wasted. In your bags, you will find the agenda. As I say, we've got lots of, um, I, don't, I think I have another, another slide coming here. There we go. Um, at the top of your bag, you've got all this sort of useful information for the day, like where we are, um, like the Wi-Fi codes, like Mentimeter codes, like Twitter names and hashtags. So for all sort of Twitter people out there, please use Twitter extensively. Um, and what you also have in your, well, actually, you don't have it in the bag, you have it on yourselves, is a little wooden badge. And the wooden badge was a marvelous idea by Marie van der Waal, our, our fellow co-coordinator, um, in order to make a stand on using less plastic in conferences. So the idea really is that you reuse these beautiful wooden badges and actually tell organizers of conferences that you don't need their horrible little plastic bag. No, you've got a beautiful wooden badge from, from Eclipse. Um, so please tweet about it as much as you, as you, as you can or want to. And then finally, um, the whole conference is being live streamed because there was a very high interest in the conference. Um, so uh, we decided that it would be a good idea to live stream it. And then at the end of the um, conference, all the videos will be posted on the website so that people who couldn't attend today can still learn more about Eclipse. All right, I think I'm covered on the, live on the, on the housekeeping. So, without further ado, um, it is my great pleasure now to pass over to Christos Fragakis, who is the Acting Head of the Sustainable Management of Natural Resources Unit at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation at the European Commission for some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Christos. Uh, 
thank you very much indeed, uh, Julieta. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it, is, uh, it gives me an enormous pleasure and it's a great privilege for me to open this uh, conference for uh, Eclipse. Uh, as you know, Eclipse is a coordination support action. We have funded that back in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Coordination support action means that uh, it is not to generate new knowledge, uh, but to take stock of what is already available out there and then try to uh, make an optimal use of that. So for us, uh, when, we, uh, when we designed the, the topic uh, for this call, what we were looking for was uh, to come with a mechanism, a support mechanism, to assist the policy makers, the businesses and the civil society to work together in creating a solid and transparent evidence base about biodiversity and ecosystem services and to provide swift responses to policy makers as the issues emerge during the policy making or the, during the policy implementation phase. So this conference today, and I was very much looking forward to that, it will give us a good opportunity to see the many goodies that Eclipse has produced over the last uh, two or three years. Uh, and then also a forum for all of us to co-create, uh, to exchange uh, opinions, you know, how we can make this mechanism to further improve. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when we drafted this topic, uh, my colleagues and myself back, that was in the work program 2014 uh, for a, a EU mechanism for biodiversity ecosystem services, uh, we had the following salient objectives in mind. First of all, we were looking for to set up a light, flexible, and transparent, and I have to underline this word, a transparent governance to make, give confidence to the policy makers that the outputs of this mechanism will be well adopted and well accepted by the broader scientific and policy community. So we were looking for a, a structure that in time will become self-sustainable. Of course, that is a huge challenge and we are fully aware of that, that it's, it's not so easy to make a self-sustainable structure that uh, addresses these type of issues. To support us, and when I say us, I say DG research, but also the DG environment colleagues, uh, in shaping the evidence-based policy on biodiversity ecosystem service in the EU. A structure that will not start from the scratch, but will build on what is existing already out there. As I said, the coordination support action is not to generate new knowledge, but to tap upon existing uh, knowledge and structures. And then try to link with existing knowledge networks as a network of networks. That was the first time that I came across to this, uh, to this term, thanks to Eclipse, what is a network of networks to harness existing knowledge and expertise through innovative and transparent approaches. And I can tell you straight away that personally, I have been extremely amazed to see the innovative, the innovative processes that Eclipse has put in place in order to mobilize communities so, so swiftly. A structure that will be, uh, will be inclusive, will be able to accommodate all the EU members and the associated and accession countries, it will be capable to mobilize society, research and policy actors to co-create, co-creation is a magic word, particularly in the, in the EU jargon nowadays, uh, to, the, capable to, to co-create uh, the evidence base that it is needed uh, and to come up with swift, trustworthy and timely science-based responses for better informed policy and decision making. So the salient features we were looking for were openness, flexibility, inclusiveness, trustworthiness and swiftness in providing the information that was needed. So, of course, that is an extremely challenging task, and we were aware of the difficulty of the task, but we feel, having seen what Eclipse has produced up to now, we feel that thanks to the innovative uh, approach that Eclipse uh, has adopted, they have managed to address the challenge in a very, very uh, satisfactory and impressive way. I can, rec I can recall back uh, two or three years, and Christoph can help me there because, uh, you know, my memory is uh, not very good. When we came up with the first request from RTD to Eclipse uh, some years ago, and that was for the creation of a framework uh, to assess the impact of nature-based solutions to societal challenges. As you know, my unit is uh, working, is, has been engaging very, very heavily in developing, testing, validating nature-based solutions to address societal challenges. So it was very, very important for us uh, to have such a framework in order to be able to intercompare what is the, uh, the, the, the impact of the different solutions and also to intercompare the uh, performance of the different projects that we have been funding. 
Then following the request, uh, first of all, I have to thank Eclipse uh, for helping us to shape the request, because that is already for a policy maker. It's very, very important to shape the request properly in order for the scientific community to, to address it adequately. So we were amazed to see that the, in a very, very short time, Eclipse managed to come up with an invitation for call for interest. And then 117, Alan, probably 117, I believe, people replied and they engaged to become part of the working group, whatever you establish, in order to elaborate this framework. And that is quite an impressive outcome to see, you know, such a mobilization of the scientific community in uh, addressing collectively something and, uh, you know, we were quite amazed. Now, the report that came out of that, uh, from, from the, uh, it, it gives, uh, it allows people how to select indicators, if you like, in order to assess the impact of the nature-based solutions. And I can tell you that that is the Bible, if I can call it this way, that all the projects that we are funding uh, within Horizon 2020 under the Society of Challenge 5 is using in order to select indicators to assess the impact. Of course, the projects are being asked uh, to further build on that, uh, to test uh, the indicators, and then to come up probably to suggest alternative indicators that might be more appropriate to that. Now, to recapitulate, uh, the key factors for Eclipse success, it is in our opinion, if you like. First of all, that it brings uh, within relatively very short time the right people at the right uh, place. Second, it manages the expectations from the policy makers. That means it makes the policy make, makers aware of the limitations that exist for science to provide the solutions that we are looking for. It uh, facilitates the co-creation in better shaping the request uh, as well as the reply, the, the outcomes. It is able to respond very quickly to incoming requests and timing, as you know, for the policy making is extremely important. And then it makes an optimal use of the expertise and the outreach capacity of the extensive networks that already existed there in formulating the responses. So this transparent and open process gives confidence to the policy makers, ourselves, you know, the, the colleagues from this environment, if you like, about the outcomes. And also it makes policy makers realize, as I said, that there is a degree of uncertainty in whatever replies Eclipse or any other consultation provides to them. Now, Eclipse has a very strong societal dimension in its approaches, with uh, several the numerous science cafes that it has organized, the societal organize, organizations that it has engaged, the NGOs, for example. And this clearly brings an extra added value to the science policy society interfaces. Also, we're extremely pleased to see that thanks to Eclipse uh, linked with the European Parliament, with GRC, and also with the so-called SAM mechanism, the Science Advice Mechanism for the European Commission. So we can say that Eclipse is a kind of sort of unifying or uniting mechanism to link together the different EU institutions together with the advisory bo bodies for science policy and society interfaces. Now, what we can say today, and then I'm very much looking forward to the, the, the conference for the next uh, few days, is that Eclipse has developed, tested, and validated a very large number of methodologies for rapidly engaging, engaging the society, the scientific community, and the policy community in consultation process. And that, as I said, for us is a very, very, very valuable uh, uh, result. These methodologies, together with the plan for self-sustainability, will be discussed, will be subject of discussion, as you know, for today and tomorrow. And then I believe that uh, I will invite all of you, including myself, if you like, to be actively engaged uh, in discussing, debating, providing new ideas or something, how to further improve this mechanism for the future, and also how to come up with a magic formula to make this me mechanism self-sustainable. Now, in conclusion, I can say without any hesitation that the Eclipse mechanism is the type of mechanism that we in RTD, as a policy DG now, would like to, 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 to have uh, in order to allow ourselves uh, to come at whatever moment in time with an issue that emerges during the policy making and the implementation process, uh, and then knowing that we will receive a robust, transparent reply within very, very short uh, time limits. Uh, so, in concluding, I would like again to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, place. I'm very much looking forward to very active, engaged discussions by all of us, and then also looking forward to see a more detailed presentation of the achievements that Eclipse has made. Thank you very much indeed. I wish you a very, a very, uh, 
a very good conference. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Christos, and thank you for all the support as well from DGRNI, not just for the Eclipse project, but more broadly in terms of um, helping to understand and improve science policy interfaces on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, all right, so before I start on the presentation, um, of Eclipse, we're going, to, we're going to try out Mentimeter, which is really exciting. Um, now, a quick question, does anybody not have a smartphone? Great, oh, okay, there's one person in the back. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I don't know if Ines is around. Ines, no. There is a tablet downstairs at the registration if you want to borrow. Oh yes, the computer would work fine as well. So if you don't have a computer or a smartphone, there is a tablet at registration that you can, that you can get. And actually, before I forget as well, Ines isn't here, but could all the Eclipse team stand up? And could everybody just um, find your nearest Eclipse team member? And if you have any questions or queries or anything during the day, just grab an Eclipser and they will help you. If it's related to Eclipse, I can't guarantee that they will help you on everything in your life. But if it's related to Eclipse, they're, they're your person. All right, great. Um, okay, Marie, I'm going to hand over to Marie van der Waal, who is going to help us through Mentimeter. Well, How exciting. <laughs> First time ever. Good morning, everybody. My name is Marie van der Waal, and I'm a happy uh, member of the co-coordination team of Eclipse. And indeed, we are gonna do something very unusual in a conference. We are gonna ask you to play with your uh, phone. <laughs> Uh, and uh, especially actually after the, the result of our request on electromagnetic radiation, yes. so maybe don't read it yet, <laughs> read it after the conference. Uh, okay, so the idea is to uh, take your phone and follow the very easy instructions that are over there. Take your phone, type on internet, uh, so you of course need to have access to internet and it's on your agenda. It's very easy, it's academy, it's open. It's uh, the easiest access you can have, I think. And then you type www.manti.com. And then they will directly have an interface asking you a code. And the code is up there. So it's 885314. Very well. Yes, and, <laughs> and just to taste out, we have the first question you will see, hopefully, hopefully we'll get 100%, but <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so the first question is, what does Eclipse stand for? So the first, one is European Kindergarten Lost Infants Planning Secret Escapade. The second one is European Kennel for Lions, Iguanas, Pigs, Scorpions and Hearwings. The third one is Knowledge and Learning Mechanisms on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. The third one is European Kid Loving Individuals Proposing Super Endeavours. And the last one is European Knowledge Learning Interface for people to fight species extinction. Now the floor is yours, you just vote uh, for the one you think is the right answer. Yes. Um. Ah, now. Okay, still <laughs> 47 people, okay, let's see how many percentage that makes. 80%, not too bad, I think. Uh, we, we had the right to have a 20% people lost. Yeah. Maybe they don't know where they are. <laughs> the, the, um, the following one is actually, w this, exactly. Exactly. Yes. yes. <laughs> Good. Well done. Okay. Next question. What type of organization do you represent? 
government, academic, NGO, corporate, oh, societal, or other. Academic, yes. Very well. Oh, we are, yes. <laughs> it's just, I think it's maybe not representing because I think maybe academic people are more resistant to bugs and are more prone to come through the snow, maybe. <laughs> we don't know, but it's maybe linked. Marie, we should say that the people on live streaming can join. Ah, yeah, of course. People on live streaming are welcome to join us. I forgot to say that at the beginning. Uh, you can take your phone or take your computer and welcome to vote as well. Good, very well. So academic, 59%, 60%, NGO, 12 corporate, 3 other. Maybe people would like to, people who are from other could maybe tell from where they are from. Yes, civic. And, okay, in limbo. Okay, <laughs> very well. <laughs> As a category, <laughs> we should have. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm from the IPES uh, Technical Support Unit on Capacity Building. Okay, very well. Thank you very much. Very well. Okay, so next slide. What has been your engagement with Eclipse uh, so far? So, uh, have you been a requester? Have you been an expert? Have you been reviewing the request report? Um, have you part of uh, Eclipse? Obviously, Eclipse are really keen on using their phone. <laughs> uh, so the knowledge coordination body, the strategic advisory board at the business plan group, or you have not yet been engaged in Eclipse, but you wanted to and you are interested, not yet engaged, but know about Eclipse, and you don't know anything about Eclipse. Ah, good. Two people, that's good. <laughs> so percentage-wise. Okay. Ooh, la la, we are <laughs> a lot of eclipsers. Okay, everybody has voted. Uh, no. <laughs> we overrun. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it for the moment, but uh, you will play with your phone more during the day. Thank you very much, Marie. And actually, I think that was a perfect um, introduction to my talk because one of the things that you need to know about Eclipse is that we're not scared of using new things. We're a very innovative um, mechanism. Okay, so um, Eclipse is a project that's uh, funded by the European Commission under Horizon 2020, as Christa says, and it started in February 2016 and it ends this time next year. Um, but it's much, much more than a, a project with a sort of defined end date. It really um, aims to uh, develop, as Christa says, this long-term self-sustaining and flexible mechanism um, for evidence-informed decision-making affecting biodiversity and ecosystem services. Before I go on, I want to thank uh, Marie and, and Alan and all the rest of the Eclipse team for helping with this presentation and for helping facilitate all our activities in Eclipse so far. So, the main thing about Eclipse really is that it's built on a vision that, um, that we've held for a very long time and that we hope you all uh, agree with by the end of the day. And that vision is really to build this innovative, light, ethical and self-sustainable EU support mechanism and to, very importantly, to hand that mechanism over to the wider community once established. And this is a really key point of Eclipse because Eclipse is not a closed process. It's never been a closed process. It's always really aimed to um, work with and for all knowledge requesters and all knowledge holders in the EU. And in order to achieve this vision, the mechanism has to be built on some very strong roots. And this is why the symbol for Eclipse is a, is a tree. And the roots of this tree are a very strong ethical infrastructure, joint evidence activities, a bottom-up and self-organizing process, and a very strong focus on networking. And of course, I'm going to run through these um, as I go through the, the presentation. 
So, what led us to this uh, vision? Well, we felt that there was a very strong policy need for a mechanism like Eclipse. And that's because policy and other decision makers, other societal decision makers, have very specific questions and have very specific knowledge needs that they require at specific times. And the, the current sort of approaches that we have do have a number of drawbacks. And those drawbacks are that often there's quite a bias either in the geographic range that's explored or the range of experts that are used in terms of disciplines, for example, but also in terms of knowledge type. And the fact that there's often a focus on scientific knowledge rather than more inclusive uh, forms of, of, of knowledge. And there's also often a bias in methods. So in terms of knowledge synthesis, you know, people will often go with a method that they like or trust, but it might not be the method that's most adapted to, actual, to the actual needs of the, of the requesters. In addition, research, for example, may miss some key policy windows. So we know that policy works in a different way to research, and sometimes we, can't, we just can't wait three to five, five years to actually get the sort of, of results that we need. And in addition, the final product may not actually correspond to policy needs, and that's often because the scoping or the framing of the question might not have been carried out fully at the beginning, or it might be because research may have strayed a little bit in the course of, of, of its, its, uh, its processes and actually gone towards a, a product that's no longer relevant or needed for policy. So the, the, the result really is that very often we see that research is not necessarily credible, legitimate or relevant to policy making processes, which is very frustrating both for research and for policy. But we also realized that there was a science need for Eclipse. Um, at the moment, it's quite difficult for researchers still to know how to engage with policy. And even if they know how to engage with policy, it's not always a given that they're going to be acknowledged for their SPI work. SPI work takes a huge amount of time and energy and resources, which are often not acknowledged because, because we're, we're recognized for different things. And there's also a huge amount of science that's potentially very useful for policy, but is underused. And again, that's very frustrating from a, from a research and funder perspective. In addition, there's now an accountability issue with funders increasingly demanding policy impact. Um, but the engagement in science policy processes uh, can give researchers better awareness of what research is policy relevant. So, therefore, it does increase funding competitiveness. So there's a need for it, but it's not necessarily easy for scientists to know how to engage with policy. Now, I'm going to give you a quick anecdote here. You're going to wonder why there's the photo of a small child on my presentation, but it is my child, so it's okay. Um, so, last week, I told my, my kids that I was yet again going away, um, and I told them that it was very exciting because it was for the Eclipse conference. And um, quite sweetly, bearing in mind that Eclipse has somewhat dominated my life for the last few years, my daughter finally said, oh, mum, what's Eclipse? Uh, so that was quite nice for her to take an interest at this very late stage. Um, anyway, beside that, so I explained the project at length, which is what I do quite a lot, and, uh, and she sort of looked at me quite quizzically at the end, as if like, why are you taking 10 minutes to explain something so simple? And she said, okay, so what you're doing is you're helping to bring people together who know to help other people who need to know. And I was, there was a mix of really impressed and really annoyed <laughs> because I was just like, why didn't I ask my daughter this three years ago? And then we had our strapline for the project. But better late than never, and maybe this is one of the key things to come out already of this, of this conference. So from now on, if you ever need someone to help communication on your projects, just come to me and I can, uh, I can lend you, I can lend you her, her knowledge. But she's basically completely right. In a nutshell, this is exactly what Eclipse does. Eclipse helps bring together people who know to help other people who need to know. I could stop my presentation now, but I'd already pre prepared some things. So I'm going to carry on anyway. Um, all right, so basically what we do, we do a few very key things. The first thing is that we answer key questions from policy and or society by mobilizing and synthesizing the best available knowledge and mobilizing the best available experts. 
We also identify current and future emerging issues of policymakers and citizens related to biodiversity and ecosystem services. We create a responsive and active network of experts and knowledge holders across Europe that are acknowledged for providing their knowledge and expertise. We improve citizens' engagement in science policy society interface activities. And we link up with international science policy interfaces such as ITBES, SEPSTA, etc. And in order to do all this, we have a very strong governance structure, which was seen at the very beginning, even before the beginning of the project, as something that was absolutely essential to deliver what we wanted to deliver. So, we have a strategic advisory board that advises on policy relevance of topics to adopt and suggests wonderful things like proof of concept conferences. Um, we have a knowledge coordination body, or KCB, that sets up and coordinates all the expert working groups and is very active in the framing and the scoping of all our requests with our requesters. We have a secretariat that manages the day-to-day -day processes supporting the KCB, the Strategic Advisory Board and the expert working groups. And we have a methods expert group that provides advice on the choice and the application of the best or the most appropriate knowledge synthesis methods. And to show how it all works in practice, we have, um, we have this, uh, this uh, little uh, diagram, but we also have a short film to explain how it works. And I think if I press on this button, it'll just happen. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry, that's great. West. The process starts with an open invitation to decision makers and policy makers across the EU to put forward a call for requests. A request can be a question like, what is the current knowledge on a particular issue? Then our knowledge coordination body will screen and select the calls for requests supported by our strategic advisory board. Next, we start the in-depth process of scoping and framing the request with the requester to find out what exactly they want to know, why they want to know it, and how could Eclipse give added value in terms of what they need? This also involves sending out a public call for knowledge. We promote all calls for knowledge on our NOC forum and disseminate them through our network of networks and wider stakeholders who have knowledge in a particular area of expertise. Knowledge holders post comments on the NOC forum telling us about any existing publications, projects or reviews on the topic. This means we can avoid duplicating any existing studies. Once we have that knowledge at our fingertips, we can go back to the requester and say, OK, there's been quite a lot done on this. What does it mean in terms of reframing the request? The next step is to agree with the requester on the document of work. This document captures the essence of the request, so why the request is being put forward and what the requester wants from the process, as well as highlighting the EU policy relevance of the request. Once this is agreed, we put out a public call for experts on the requester's topic. This call for experts is promoted on our NOC forum and the Eclipse website and is also sent out to our network of networks. The Knowledge Coordination Body conducts a selection process to make sure the best people from different sectors, different disciplines and different parts of the EU can all contribute their expertise. Then we set up an expert working group which will work to all the guidelines agreed in the document of work. The expert working group develops a protocol of methods and approach, which describes exactly how they will answer the request. This process is supported by our method experts group. The protocol is put out for extended peer review, which involves an open consultation with the public and all the knowledge holders of that particular topic. Once all the feedback is received, the expert working group adapts the protocol in discussion with the requester. Next, 
the expert working group synthesizes all the current knowledge following the selected knowledge synthesis method and produces an end product like a report. Then we conduct another cross peer review to make sure the end product is robust and credible. The end product is then given to the requester and finally it is widely disseminated and made publicly available to all. And that's it. Okay. Oh, sorry, that was a, a bit of an abrupt end there. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you very much as well for Jill for that very calming uh, and lovely voice. Um, and obviously we have uh, quite a range of requesters that have asked us uh, to uh, synthesize knowledge on particular knowledge needs that they had. And they're all in, again, in your little packs. You'll see there's a, there's a copy of the review process here with all the different uh, requests that we've received. And they're all going to be in the market stands later on. So you can actually go and, and get much, much more information on each of those different, uh, different requests that we've worked on. So this is what you have. In your, in your registration pack, and this is what you'll see in the market stands as well. Um, all right, so what are, the, what are the advantages of the Eclipse approach? Well, the first key advantage in our mind is that the Eclipse approach really responds directly to policy and other societal actors' knowledge needs through our regular calls for requests. So we've never taken the option of guessing, double guessing, what requesters might need. We've never done that. We've always been very open in asking them directly what their knowledge needs are. And, uh, and we've been very successful in receiving lots of, of requests and, and dealing with them as, as, as needed. The other key advantage is that we frame questions directly with the requesters to better understand what knowledge they need, for what purposes, in what time scale, and with which resources. So again, we've never assumed we know what they need. Or we've never assumed that they're necessarily sure of what they need. There's quite a long scoping process in which we actually discuss um, that very issue with them. To give you an example, here was an initial request that we received from IUCN and the Swedish Board of Agriculture. And the way it was framed was how to improve biodiversity results of greening measures in the common agricultural policy. Now, through the scoping process and through our call for knowledge, we actually realized that science had partly answered this question. And so it, it, it led to a, a further discussion with these two requesters, but also with a range of other relevant stakeholders through workshops, etc., to reformulate the request as understanding farmer uptake in terms of what measures are most promising to deliver on supporting biodiversity and ecosystem services in the next round of the CAP. And the expert working group um, that, have, uh, that have tackled this question have actually now produced a draft report that's out for consultation, for peer review. It's uh, open until the 25th of this month. So if any of you are interested in contributing to that review, please do. And there'll be much more information um, at, the, at the stand in the, in the, market, in the marketplace. Um, OK. We also have another key advantage, with the, which is that the Eclipse approach builds on existing knowledge. So we acknowledge the fact that there's a huge amount of research and knowledge out there that we're underutilizing. And what we do is that we then link the requests for knowledge to the most relevant knowledge holders. Um, and we do this in a completely open way, as I said before. We have open calls advertised on our website and advertised through social media, etc. And these can be calls for um, experts to join our expert working groups. They can be calls for reviews of our protocols or reports, as in the, the, the agricultural request. And they can also be calls to join our governance body. So all the calls are always completely open on our website for anyone to, um, to apply to. Another key added value of the Eclipse approach is that we have a methods expert group that's very active on all our requests. At the very beginning of the, their work, they identified 21 knowledge synthesis methods, which is a huge number, and I think we were all very surprised, actually, that so many came out. Again, I think that shows our over-reliance, maybe, on a few knowledge synthesis methods that are not always tailored to our needs. 
And here, in the report that they've developed, and again, there are lots of copies of that report in the marketplace, so please pick up a copy if, if you can. Um, but they outline the most relevant methods to match the requester's needs. So what they do is that they, they add in their report, there are lots of pros and cons of the approaches, under which circumstances one would use them, at which stage of the policy cycle, with which budget, with which time scale, etc., to really pinpoint the best methods that one can use. And this report has now been shared very widely with decision makers, as well as with the scientific advice mechanism of the European Commission, and I think Stuart will say a few more words about that in the panel later. Um, and finally, the key added value or advantage of the Eclipse approach is that we build all our activities on a very strong ethical infrastructure and a very strong focus on networking and institutional support. So in terms of the, the ethical infrastructure, again, there's a stand in the, in the marketplace. We've identified 13 main measures and the three main guiding blocks that are guidance, management, and control. We've already put in place a number of these measures the ones that are sort of grounded at the bottom on the, uh, on the, uh, on the picture, and then we're, we're working on implementing the remainder over the course of the, of the project. And so now just a few examples of the requests that we have received and the sorts of approaches that we've used. Again, for more detail, please go and talk to the people, the requesters and the, and the experts and the, the secretariat and other members of the team who've worked on these requests. So as Christos says, the, the first request was on NBS um, and developing an evaluation framework. We had 117 applicants and um, in our call for experts and 15 members of the expert working group. We had 30 people um, who offered to review our protocol and our synthesis uh, review, and we, in the end, developed one final report, one executive summary, a press relief, a release, a policy brief, a scientific paper, and several presentations to actually disseminate that work across, across Europe, and a forum discussion on Opler as well. And from the beginning to the end of that process, it took eight months. So really, it was a really sort of, um, it was a really excellent first request to have to show that the, that the approach could work. And again, there are lots of copies of that report out there, so please pick, pick a, a, a copy up uh, later on. Um, another request that, that we did was a foresight request this time um, on the impact of electromagnetic radiation on wildlife. So we used a very different approach here because we realized very early on in the call for knowledge that there wasn't a huge amount of scientific data on this issue. So we couldn't just do a, a knowledge synthesis uh, process. We realized that it was an emerging issue and that we had to use different means. Again, from the beginning to the end, it took seven months. Bug Life uh, was the requester in, uh, in that particular case. And the outputs was a, a web conference with over 60 participants from 19 countries and two final reports. And that's that request had a lot of media coverage because I think a lot of people realize that it's an issue that maybe is under-researched at the moment, but one that could become a, an issue in the future. And finally, just to show you another very different approach, um, in this case, a request put to us by Client Earth, looking at the diverse values of nature and integrating them into decision making. Um, so that, that request took a, a year, and in order to, to, to look at that request, we realized that it was really useful to have the input from a diverse range of societal actors, and therefore, um, for that request, three science cafes were carried out with um, an output of a final report at the end. Again, please refer back to the, um, the market stands. All of the requests uh, that, are on, that are on here in your, in your, uh, in your pack uh, are represented outside, including as well some requests on some of the mechanisms underlying uh, Eclipse, like the ethical infrastructure, capacity building, the network of networks, our internal evaluation, etc. Um, so, to conclude, Ah, no, that's not to conclude at all. Um, <laughs> that's just what I just said. That's the list of all the market stands outside. Great. Okay, good. Um, so, to conclude, um, Eclipse already has a huge range of outputs and a very strong legacy. So, as, we, as I've shown, we've, we've already um, had a, a number of Eclipse processes in terms of policy requests. So, we had our three calls for requests. That ended up in 15 
requests being selected. Five have now been completed, eight are in the process, three still in scoping, three in draft synthesis, so, so very much towards the end, and three in review, again, towards the end of the process, and two were, were stopped, um, either because the question was already answered or uh, it wasn't really possible to, 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 to go through with the question in the way that it was, it was, it was aimed. Um, we've also supported capacity event, capacity building events, uh, and we have a number of tools um, on our website, including the knowledge synthesis methods, guidance notes on absolutely every stage of our process and how to, how to carry it out, um, and practical guides on organizing horizon scanning activities, and obviously the ethical infrastructure that we've just, uh, that we've just mentioned. So we think that um, in terms of, of continuation, uh, we do carry on testing, learning from, and adapting our approach to check that it's fit for purpose. And we're constantly doing this through our, um, uh, our evaluation process. And the workshop tomorrow will be very much about, about that, about continuing with your input to improve our processes. Um, and then, of course, we'll hand over the legacy to the broader community uh, to be a self-sustained mechanism post-January 2020. We've already uh, written a rollout plan, a business plan, if you like, which will be uh, presented later on today, but also will be discussed more extensively tomorrow and then signed off at the end of this month. Um, and, uh, and obviously that will be key for whoever takes over the mechanism to uh, tailor that rollout plan to their, to their activities. Before I finish this, I do want to stress that we firmly believe that Eclipse works. And we think that Eclipse works for policy because it's based on years of research on the challenges of science policy interfaces. It provides outputs that decision makers need in the format and time scale that they need them in to the highest possible standard and following a robust and transparent process. And it works for research. We've engaged now with over 500 scientists, practitioners, and decision makers since the beginning of the project, through requests, through our expert working groups, through our workshops, etc. And we believe that this process of engagement has increased the researchers' knowledge of policy processes, it's increased their scientific networks, and it's definitely led to the researchers being part of these processes demonstrating policy impact. So I really sincerely hope that uh, for all of those who have engaged with Eclipse so far, this tallies with, with what you've experienced, and also for those who are interested in engaging with Eclipse in the future, that you will join us in this endeavor. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, so, any quick questions at this stage, bearing in mind that there will be a, a panel just, uh, just now on, um, with, with key members of, of, of Eclipse for uh, maybe some more in-depth questions. But any questions just, just at this stage? Also, Marie has another Mentimeter question. Yep. Yeah. Then I have a question for all of you. Okay. Okay. So the next, no, sorry. The next question is, what are your expectations for this conference? And here you can type a few words, a sentence, or a paragraph, <laughs> if you want. And what I forgot to say is that um, all the Mentimeter question will be compiled, and as our transparency principle is very high in Eclipse, everything will be on our website. So you will be able to consult the result of the Mentimeter. So don't say anything rude. Yeah. <laughs> we have a profanity filter. <laughs> so, yeah. What are your expectations for this conference? Networking, very well. Understand how the mechanisms can last. That's a really good question. We probably have the, the same one. Better understanding of the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. See how it become involved. Okay, very well. That's uh, very nice. Learn about the future of the network of network and Eclipse. I will show the rest. Oh, check for usefulness. Yes. 
understand the rollout plan very well. <laughs> Networking building, a proof of future existence. Networking come often. Hmm? Yeah, can we slide a bit under that everybody can see? Ah, okay, super. Good ideas and vibes for the continuation of Eclipse. Nice one. <laughs> Get inspired. Something in Spanish or something that I don't understand. <laughs> How to proceed. <laughs> After two o'clock. <laughs> okay. Very well. Learn about the future of Eclipse. That's coming also often. How these mechanisms can be used in other science policy areas. Meeting people. Yes, and I think that's what your expectations are. Very well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Marie. Um, so while the panelists uh, for panel one come together and sit down, um, if, you, if you have any questions, then, uh, then please fire away. No. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over now to the chair of this, uh, of this panel, Alan Watt, who is a co-coordinator of Eclipse and also the chair of our knowledge coordination body. Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliet. Yeah, have you got another seat? Have we got have we got everybody here? Ah. Uta, are you here or are you stuck in the snow somewhere? Um where is Miriam? Okay, now, now it's, um, thank you very much, Juliet, um, for a wonderful introduction to Eclipse. Uh, this, this doesn't look very secure. Marie, could everybody move that way a little bit and kind of go around it? Uh, not too far, please. Um, okay, uh, so n now, it, now it's time to, to hear about the perspectives that different people who have engaged in Eclipse up to now have. So, so people on the knowledge coordination body, um, the expert working group representative, uh, people just involved in different parts of Eclipse. So what I'd like to do is to ask uh, each of them three questions um, and then we'll give you an opportunity to reflect on what they've said, again using Mentimeter, and then we'll open up the floor to general questions from you. So um, before you answer the question, could you just, in a nutshell, which is kind of the phrase of the conference, isn't it, Juliet? Nutshell, say what your, your name, your role in Eclipse. We, we did have names, uh, by the way, to put in front of everybody, but without a table, I don't think that's going to work. Your, your name, your role in, in relation to Eclipse. And, and the first question is, fr from your perspective, what is the main added value of the Eclipse approach. And I'm going to start with 
I was, I was going to start with this end this oh, time. Okay, sorry. Um, now, so the, the idea is that you're really succinct, so you set an example um, so that Carla can write down what you're saying. Okay, and this is where I, I wish my daughter were here then. Um, <laughs> No, for me, the, the key, one of the key added values is the fact that we frame the question with the, with the requesters um, in order for them to have what they actually need. Thank you. Um, I'm Miriam Grace of the... Oh, sorry, I, everyone knows who you are, I think. <laughs> but yeah, Miriam Grace of the Methods Group. So from my perspective, uh, one of the main strengths of the CLIPS as well is that we, we engage with policy, we bring, we bring people together to answer policy relevant questions using methods that are very likely to be unfamiliar to them. So this is a way of providing exceptional value, bringing new methods to answer policy questions. So it's, for you, it's the new methods. Okay, you got that, Carla? Okay, so. Okay, <laughs> nice and short. <laughs> So my name is Marie Vandwell again, and uh, I'm part of the co-coordination team of Eclipse, but I'm also part of the secretariat body, and I was also leading the um, um, implementation of the ethical infrastructure. And that's actually what I think is one of the added value of Eclipse, is that we have built all our activities on a very strong ethical infrastructure to ensure the legitimacy and the credibility um, of the processes. Hello, um, I'm Rania Spiropoulou and uh, I have been a, an external uh, member of the knowledge coordinating body, uh, meaning that I was not there when the project was drafted and I'm not working in, uh, in the organizations that carry out the, the project. So from my perspective as an external member, the, uh, it, I was, uh, I think that the methods uh, the work on the methods is very important. And I say this from, from a part from the civil society because, uh, I'll put it straightforward, there's a lot of fake news and uh, a lot of um, uh, influences out in the world and you cannot um, know what to believe and not to believe. So I saw the added value of the methods as very important and the more it is taken up, by the scientific community uh, and the society per se, also reporters and so on, uh, the media and people who are formulating the public opinion is, is very important. I think this is a, a unique uh, project for that reason. Thank you. Thank you. Before you, before you move on to, to you, Henry, I, I don't know if you made it clear in your presentation that the, the, knowledge co the members of the knowledge coordination body are now all external to yes. the... The first phase was not... Yeah. The second phase, yeah. they are, we are all external, yes. Okay. Henry. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. So, um, uh, Henry Roof from uh, University of Bern. Uh, I'm representing a, a requester. So, the added value for us was obviously to be able to ask a question uh, for which we had absolutely no clue about. We never worked in Europe, so we, don't, we know the EU energy policy vaguely as the European citizens, but it's not our area of expertise, so that was a great opportunity to put that question. Uh, the value added was also the data-rich findings we got with a lot of support for the modeling and the methodology. And, of course, the policy relevance, because we will use these results and integrate them in the Global Sustainable Development Report, which 15 scientists across the world are drafting for the United Nations. Okay, thank you very much. Alexandra. Okay. My name is Alexandra Lux, and I'm part of the team for the formative evaluation. And we put an emphasis on formative, not on evaluation or on assessing. Uh, so we try to provide spaces for reflection and learning and asking naughty questions to have a kind of impulse for thinking about what is happening in the mechanism. And what we have seen in the, those exercises that beyond the very profound processes, the governance structure is a main added value of the mechanism because it's reliable through its flexibility, flexibility and transparency. And so you can see when you look through the different bodies that there's a high transparency what the tasks and duties are and how they connect 
And you see that it's highly reflected within Eclipse, but also, as um, Juliet mentioned, in the processes before. So there's a reliable basis for putting it forward. Okay, thank you. Rika. Hello, I'm Rika Palonimi from Finnish Innovative Institute, SYKE. And SYKE has been leading work packets for social engagement in Eclipse. And from that perspective, the major, one major value is the potential to significantly improve science policy, society, communication, interaction on European scale. We all know that it's really de demanding efforts due to the complexity of issues and complexity of social positions of various people and stakeholders that operate on European scale and the Europe, uh, geographic and demographic diversity that exists in Europe, e Europe. But still I think that the lessons learned we have made and that will be made in the future are ex extremely valuable in order to increase legitimacy and effectiveness of European biodiversity and ecosystem service policies. And allowing discovering and testing of new ways to reach broader audiences and seeing what works and what, what is not working has been very valuable for Ex Eclipse. Thank you. Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Christopher Raymond uh, from the Swedish University of Agricultural Science and University of Helsinki uh, was the co-chair of the NBS expert working group and lead author of the NBS assessment framework, which there are copies at the back on. Uh, the added value of Eclipse, um, to me, uh, having also been now a coordinating lead author of IPES values assessment. I think one of the added values that I'm taking into that assessment is the process through which we can bring uh, different forms of knowledge to the table, but also at different stages in the process. For example, in the MBS um, report, we reached out to current EU pro projects who may have not published their work yet, but had some important evidence to share. Uh, and we invited them to um, webinars and other uh, sessions to actually obtain their knowledge. So we had recent current knowledge coming to the table. And we also did that with some policy makers so that we can also obtain the policy relevant insights, including with um, Christos's group. So I think the, the whole process of bringing timely relevant knowledge to the table is something that we can really learn from the Eclipse process. Okay, thank you, Chris. Maurice. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am the last one in a long row, so I've got hardly anything to add, but first introduce myself. I'm chairing the Research Institute for Nature and Forest, but I was in Eclipse context involved in the business plan group, which looked for how uh, Eclipse could uh, proceed after February 2020. Um, and in that group, I represented Alternet, which is a network of excellence that was raised during the FP6 program in the earlier days of this uh, century. I've got two things that I appreciated very much, not from a point of view of a business plan group member, but one that is the specific, the, the, the me mechanism within Eclipse in which they had the possibility to have a specific selection of experts to answer specific questions. It's not depending on what is a, available within institutes or within uh, a certain context, you can f you, they could freely look for the best experts possible um, to answer specific questions. The second one, what I appreciated very much, is the ethical part, which I translated in only three words instead of 13 uh, sentences, um, Juliette, that is one, the transparency, which was already mentioned earlier, to be obje as objective as possible and to be independent. The collection of experts answering the questions I consider as being as independent as possible from anyone who is specifically interested in answering it, a, a specific question in a certain way. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, Carla, are you ready to... Um... Okay, now's your chance to, to look, to go to Mentimeter. 
and hopefully there will be a list there. Can you, can you, okay, so you, you've all got it. Can you look at that list? And I think there's sliders there, which will allow you to roughly rate and rank the importance of these different added values from the, the way you see it. I think we all know what ethical infrastructure is. It, it's, a, it's a special type of ethical infrastructure. Okay. Do you, um, do you, particularly those other people who've been involved with Eclipse, um, are there any other added values that, that you see that are not captured here? Barbara has, is nodding here, so Barbara has got, got something to say. Thank you, Barbara Livray from the Foundation for Research on Biodiversity, I think. And, and Barbara, could you just say what your, your role is? Okay. I, I'd like to know that as well. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm a dinosaur because I was involved in biodiversity knowledge, which was the previous program uh, before Eclipse uh, came out. So I've been there since the onset of the whole ID, if I may say. I've belonged to uh, the KCB and now I'm um, mentoring, kind of, some kind of, uh, some experts group, especially the, the large expert working group uh, working on the health, uh, mental health and biodiversity aspect now. It's a huge, uh, huge request. Um, yeah, I think there is a dimension which is really missing, or probably because it's obvious. I think it's the European scale. Because we have IBES now at the international level, we know that IBES will not be able to tackle all the requests, and will tackle requests at the global level. But I think we have huge challenges in Europe, and uh, it's really good and comforting to have a mechanism that allows us to do similar things and even better, I think, uh, than invest uh, at the European scale for Europe. So that's, uh, I think it's very important. Okay. And I hope it's gonna be an example for other areas of the globe okay. as well. Thank you, Barbara. Um, anybody else? Ooh, over here and then Sibyl and over there. Good morning, I'm Jordi Cortina from the Society for Ecological Restoration. Uh, I think an added value would be something related to impact, not, not the impact of the process, within the process, but uh, the impact of the products of the, of the processes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sibyl over here on the, on the left. Uh, Good morning, I'm Sibyl. I was there before the dinosaurs. <laughs> 
I think I'm chairing the, the strategic advisory board of Eclipse. And I think one of the added values, and we'll talk about it in the, the next panel, is the fact that it's, it's connecting and trying to fill gaps in the framework of other science policy interfaces. So it's not trying to do it all, it's not trying to replace existing stuff, it's trying to help um, the whole dynamics of science policy interfaces. Thank you. Johann Spangenberg, I'm a member of the EEA Scientific Committee. Um, I'm missing some more clarity of the information about the benefits. So how many of the questions a decision maker has have one year time to be answered? How many working hours go into delivering one answer and who will provide the resources in the longer run to invest these working hours in answers? What will be the price of one answer? So what is the kind of uh, limitations? Because so far it looked like unlimited, perfect solutions and benefits only. I would like to have it a bit more specific saying, that is what we can do and that is what we cannot do. That is the conditions for really being helpful because that makes it more credible than just claiming that everything is perfect and we solve all, all problems of the science policy society interface. Yeah, th thank you for that. You, you raised some, um, some really important questions which I, in, in terms of the practicalities and uh, in terms of the business, uh, Louise will, lead a, will give a presentation this afternoon and lead a discussion then and I think uh, we might hear similar um, issues raised when we now turn to the challenges that the, the panel and others feel that e Eclipse has, has come across. Yeah, please. Hello, if I may, I'd like to m give an element of a reply. I'm Suzanne de Chevigny, also on the scientific advisory group. Um, you're quite right about the costs. I would put them in balance with the money that's put into the dissemination part of all sorts of European projects. That doesn't go very far. I'd also put into balance the uh, money wasted by policy makers not having a clear understanding of things. So I quite agree that things are, but we'll have to work out a balance and that should be part of the argument, I think. Thank you. I, I saw Eva wanting to speak. Somebody here and somebody at the back. Can we, can we stick to the added values, if we possibly can at the moment? Because yes. we're going to be talking about challenges a lot in a minute. And, and this panel, I've, I've got a lot of challenges that they want to share with you. I'm Eva Furman from the Finnish Environment Institute. And I, I was especially in the beginning of Eclipse uh, involved. And I have always seen as an indirect value from Eclipse, that it's a very inclusive one. It pushes the research community at large in Europe to be active in science policy, so it kind of uh, has an impact on a broader scale, not only through the mechanism, but uh, invites everyone to act uh, with their research. Yeah. Thank you. I think if I might share my view, I think that, that this issue of inclusivity, if that's a word, um, is probably the most important thing for me. Um, right at the, at the back, I think, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the special chair at the back. Uh, uh, you're, not, you're not sleeping over there, are you? you, you no, not okay. yet. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so, I apologize, I'm, I'm, I was a little bit late, but I think one of the biggest added value for a requester is the objectivity of the results. As uh, we're studying a lot of sensitive issues, um, Eclipse, I think we hope that if we go through that, it will give us uh, some objective uh, results. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Anybody else? No. Then I'd like to go back to the panel again. Um, did you, did you wa want to come back on anything that you've heard or should we move to the challenges issue? Okay. So we'll, we'll go back the way this time, starting with you, um, Maurice. Uh, so the next question is, um, again, from your particular perspective, wh what has been the greatest challenge in implementing the Eclipse approach? Well, as having been member of being still member of the business plan group, it's obvious the how to reach the goal after this, the February 2020, how to get it self-sustainable. And we had quite some discussion on that, on, on that issue on the, in the business plan group. One of the issues that was important to realize that there are at least four part parties who benefit, benefit from the eclipse mechanism, given the fact that it, is, it has an, an advantage of being independent, objective as possible, etc., and transparent. There are four potential uh, Beneficials, beneficials, and that's the European Commission. That's uh, the requesters, of course, that's so obvious, but also the scientific community. This is one of the best ways to get their science to, to the policymakers. And, and in the end, of course, that's more, far more difficult to prove, is the, the general public. And are, those are four parties which are potentially relevant for having it, in the end, the costs covered for, for the mechanism itself. So what I'm looking for is how to convince those four parties to get this system self-sustaining. And that can only, not only not be from one or two of those partners, but, but for all four, all four partners in what way, one way or another. Okay, thank you very much, Maurice. Chris, before you go on, uh, Carla, is, the, is it working? Yep. Excellent. Chris. Yeah, th thank you. Um, th uh, I'm going to speak from a uh, co-chair perspective here on the challenge. So we were invited to be part of this expert working group uh, in around late June. Uh, we started in July, which is essentially holiday periods in Europe. Uh, and were asked by the Commission to deliver something before Christmas. Uh, so what that meant in reality is that we, the expert working group did not really come together uh, until probably mid to late August. So we had between September and December to uh, deliver something. So we had a, it was a very short window uh, and uh, that we had to get a shared understanding not only of the topic among our experts, but also get a clarity on the scoping of the topic from the Commission. So we, that took a lot of time. So we essentially had about two and a half months to, to get the report together, which I think we did a great job. But uh, that, is, that presents a challenge. How do we actually can mm -hmm. bring experts from diverse cultures together and keep them motivated in what is a very short process? Um, but there also an opportunity there because the timing of the report was perfect, I think, in terms of uh, in influencing and informing a range of nature-based solutions European projects which started January of the following year. So there was a timing benefit for, in terms of output, but there was also a timing cost to the experts who were involved. So how do we balance that is a, it's a key challenge for Eclipse going mm. forward. Yeah. So you, you, you feel that the, the short window is, is, is the key challenge for you. But yeah, but well, bringing, it was. Yeah, you, you, you talk about bringing diverse cultures together, which is yeah. the same but a separate one, I think. Yeah, because it takes time to do that. Uh, yes. it, it, it took time to get everyone with different languages and different understandings of the topic together. It took time to understand the Commission's perspective on the request, because it was still a quite broad request. And then we had huge pressure to deliver in a couple of months. Um, which we, we did, but fortunately for me at the time, I had quite a bit of time to devote to that, mm -hmm. but I can see how other groups may not have that time. Uh, yeah. and, and so 
and, and there's also we're working for free, so we're working late nights for free, and yeah. which is another related point. It is, yeah. yes. But there's a report sitting out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Rika. In Eclipse, in Eclipse, we have had a couple of requests that have been framed as social engagement efforts. Uh, these lessons, even though not always been successful, have been really beneficial for us in developing the mechanism to make a major effort improving science policy society communication on European scale. What we have learned and that um, we have learned that, for example, science cafes work, work perfectly on national scale, uh, but instead getting engaged on European scale, it may be demanding, both for face-to-face -face and online meetings. Uh, this is especially difficult for civil society actors to engage. And that's why we need to significantly make some resources available for them. I think it, there is linked for what, what Chris was saying that people are doing for free and for civil society actors this is also difficult. And that's why we really need to think how we can make the success on that scale, how those efforts are worth doing for everybody. Uh, and then this is also linked to the challenge that our requests have been framed as social engagement effort, efforts without a direct link to scientific knowledge synthesis. And this is also linked to this time frame that is there in, in this scientific knowledge synthesis that they are quite tight, those time frames. And if we aim to make some serious social engagement as part of this short time frame, it's, it really needs coordination efforts and this kind of really good timing and co-efforts. But we see, still see here a window of opportunity to improve us, us and our working. Uh, we have a hypothesis that society should be seen as really essential part of any science policy society effort. And what we look forward is to link science society policy, these whole three perspectives into the mechanism in the future. It's important to always consider at what stage of a request, and we prefer the early one, and what social actors need to be engaged to increase legitimacy and transparency. And I, I think this is definitely something that we should really improve and pay attention to. And I, I see that integrativeness is a very relevant perspective here to do it together. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, Alexander. Yes. Um, I would like perhaps put an emphasis that might a little bit sum up what was said earlier. Because um, with a formative evaluation, we have always experienced the Eclipse project, or with its inner team, I would say, as very self-reflective. So the team and also the people were, that were involved in a wider range we're always challenging the things that have been done. So always asking, are we right? Is it good? And so where can we improve? The, these are questions. It was not no hard task for us to, to ask those questions. So they were on the table already. And I think the main challenge would be to keep the mechanism as a learning system mm -hmm. where the experiences from earlier processes or from ongoing processes could be summarized in a way in developing further the structures, the procedures, the ways of motivating, the ways of valuing the input. So the resource question is mainly one. Um, yeah. So keep a learning system, I would say. That is a yeah. really challenge on the table. Yeah. But not, don't just stop it at the end of the Eclipse project, but continue to learn during the, yeah. the next fully funded phase. Henry. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, we were absolutely impressed by the mobilization of Eclipse around our request. Um, the resources, the people, uh, the way we worked and the process uh, was really excellent. Everything was absolutely positive. Uh, there were very minor um, timeline management issues because we had to align the, the, 
the, our request and the, and the process within Eclipse to the Global Sustainable Development Report since uh, our request, the, the findings of our request would go into the, into the report. But the Global Sustainable Development Report timeline has changed as well. So at the end, things aligned quite well. So mm -hmm. that didn't turn out to be an issue at the end. But we, we faced some, some timing issues as it, as it was raised previously, and we thought things were going to be tight. But at the end, it worked out fine. So okay. um, the other challenge um, uh, we may have is that we were so excited about the, the whole process. We were wondering why not opening up to other things. I mean, biodiversity and ecosystem services are fascinating. What about extreme poverty, migration, mm -hmm. climate change? I mean, there's plenty of other <laughs> areas we would okay. be more than happy to put requests. So okay. these are maybe... We're looking forward to further requests. Yeah. In fact, thank you for your positive words there. Can we get you another cup of coffee, by the way? Yes. <laughs> um, Franja. Yes, well, I, I will follow Alexandra's uh, thinking in saying that uh, the challenge in, in the eclipse phase now, especially in the knowledge uh, coordinating body, was that it had to uh, meet, uh, to solve so many problems. This was a challenge, like which request do we take up, which is of European interest, um, and uh, how, how to do it. And it stretched out the networking aspect so it's it, it was uh, it was fascinating to see these efforts starting in the dark in some cases like the energy request that uh, we did with uh, Henry uh, to end up with uh, a, a small community of people who were interested but I, I in this learning uh, process I have to say we have been what I find a challenge is that to, in order to, uh, to to make this happen, people have been extraordinarily generous. And this is, this is very strange, but it's probably due to the fact that we were talking about biodiversity and ecosystem services, which is a part of science and a part of human values. And these groups that we came back, they were offering their time. It is very rare to see that. It is linked, I think, to the theme uh, and it reflects a little bit my, what I think it's so important in Eclipse is to continue this um, uh, interaction with society. It's building a consciousness of what uh, people think about nature in a very um, open way and structured. So the governor structure, I would say it, this was a crash test for me. That was a challenge. It was carried out successfully with the people who have been working for a long time on this issue mm. and the level of coordination, collaboration and uh, offering of time was extraordinary. I, and this would be a challenge how to, to continue. continue Thank you. Thank you. Could you t send oh. it back to Henry who wants to add something? Yes, yeah, sorry. While listening to Hania, I had actually another, another point I'd like to raise. I think in our uh, request, in our process, we are, we, there is still space to uh, be a bit more clear on how these findings will uh, serve policy and will integrate mm -hmm. policy. We have to, to actually think a little bit more on that. It's still an ongoing process, but uh, uh, this is something that remains a little bit fuzzy now and there is space for, okay. for being clear on that. Thank you. Marie. Yes. Um, actually, the, my main challenge is maybe tackled by uh, the first panelist. So I have maybe two then. Uh, the m first one will be um, to convince people who have been skeptical about the Eclipse approach and what has been said about the, bit like the magical mechanisms who will solve everything. This comes up quite often and I would like to maybe transform to these magical mechanisms and maybe to more uh, visionary mechanisms. And maybe things that are visionary maybe sometimes are a bit frightening or um, yeah, people get uh, cold feet sometimes. So maybe this would be a challenge to keep going uh, convincing people. Uh, but I think it will come with, uh, with the establishment of, of the mechanisms. 
And this uh, vision, uh, as you know, it's, it's all about improving decision making on biodiversity related issue. And uh, I would like to come back to what also Chris said. Uh, one of the challenges uh, we had so far is to keep this vision integrated in mainly in the expert working group. Because the vision is beautiful, but when reality kicked in, it's a bit hard. So the keeping the motivation for the experts to, to work very hard um, has been challenging. Uh, they all have produced beautiful uh, report and they all have been very proud, but the process was difficult. Meaning that they all, all the, all the expert working group have entered the process with a huge boost of energy. Uh, and they, it's actually really, uh, you can actually really uh, see and it's reflected in the method protocol, where the protocol is very ambitious. You know, all the protocol of the request uh, have been maybe too ambitious and we all have been worried in Eclipse because like, okay, this is quite a lot of work you're, you're planning, but no, no, they really want it and they wanted to have this protocol reviewed. So it means that they, they are entitled to do what they have promised in their protocol. And when they start to work on it, then reality kicked in, of course, because some people don't really have a backup of their institution to work 10% of their time on this. So yeah, that's, I will say, a challenge. And I hope we have some solution after because mm -hmm. the next <laughs> we're, 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 wait, we're waiting we for that. We don't end up on negative. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam. Um, as somebody who's been involved in quite a lot of requests sort of embedded from a methods perspective, um, something I've noticed is that there's a lot of variation in expert working groups and their dynamics. So, so the interesting thing about Eclipse is it brings people together who don't necessarily know each other beforehand. And sometimes that works really well and it's the start of great collaborations and sometimes it doesn't work quite as well. So I think in some cases we should be observing what makes those dynamics work in a positive way and bringing those into our approach. But there's a lot of scope and sometimes it really works amazingly. Thank you very much. We've got an additional challenge, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is Mentimeter. <laughs> um, okay, so from um, a secretariat perspective, um, I think one of the key challenges that uh, I can identify now is the, is the sort of continued resources and motivation, but from a sort of secretariat and knowledge coordination body perspective. So one of the things that we've, that we've realized as well in all our, all our requests is that so every single request has got a, a knowledge coordination body focal point and a deputy and their role in these requests is absolutely key because they really do, with the support of the secretariat, they really do um, sort of drive the sort of, the, 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 they support and they, and, they, and they motivate the expert working group. And I think one of the things that, that we need to be mindful in the future mechanism is that obviously we need to have the resources to sustain a secretariat. That's, that's obviously one, one key issue, but obviously the business plan is, is, the rollout plan tackles that quite explicitly. But the other issue is that the members of the knowledge coordination body are, are, are dedicating their time as the experts to the whole process. And some of these requests can be quite long. So obviously we've highlighted a few of the requests today that, that have been reasonably short, but some of the requests can be longer if there's no sort of definite quick policy window to address. And particularly for those long processes, having that motivation and the resources from the knowledge coordination body focal points to carry that request on through and to continue motivating their expert working groups, for me, is a, is a, is a key challenge. Okay. Thank you, Juliet. Um, the remaining challenge is which way the scale on Mentimeter works. <laughs> Technical pause here. Uh, Christos, would you like to add something while we're sorting out some technical issues? Thank you very much. Challenges. Just one question that, uh, you know, I mean, it, which probably is a, a big challenge for the for Eclipse. Now, as the mechanism goes maturing it's, uh, itself, uh, and then it goes uh, more widely used to potential requesters, uh, did you see that the number of requests was increasing logarithmically? Or, I mean, can you project what kind of resources you will need for the future? 
based on uh, what is the baseline as far as number of requests is concerned at this moment in time, you know, one year before the end of the project, if you like. Eh? Yes, please. Okay. I'm not sure this is working. Is it working? Yes, it's working. Um, so the number of requests coming in through each of the calls for requests has actually been quite steady. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers now, but actually the numbers, n the numbers coming in. But, uh, but have they changed as yet at each call for request? That for me, they, they seem to be quite steady. <laughs> yes, it was, I think, 17 for the first, um, I think 16 or 18 maybe actually for the second. The last one was less, I think, I don't remember how many, but um, the time frame to answer the, the, the call for request was much shorter. So that's probably linked. But there certainly is a related challenge there if you're setting up the business side, if you like, of a mechanism there the predictability or otherwise of the number of requests yeah. that, that, that yeah. comes in. Yeah. You've certainly been busy over the last two years. But yeah. And then, know. oh, sorry, Alan. And then, of course, the other issue is that during the project phase of Eclipse, we, did, we weren't asking requesters, obviously, to pay for their request, which obviously comes afterwards. But even so, on one of our requests, the one that uh, is on mental health and, uh, and, and um, green, green and blue spaces, we actually um, had a, 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 um, a, a, the World Health Organization contacted the focal point of that request to actually put some money in from the World Health, health Organization to, to further pursue the blue um, space element. So actually, even though we weren't asking requesters to pay for the request in this phase of the project, we have already had a requester that has put in money to, to further one aspect of it. So I think that's a really, that's a really encouraging result. Yeah. And of course, the amount that requesters pay will depend on their request. So the, the, it, it'll never be a set price, if you like, for a request, because they might need different processes, they might need a different time frame, they'll have a different budget anyway. So that'll be a discussion that we have with the requester when they put their request in, is looking at the budget that they have, what they need, what we can do to suggest methods that might, you know, still actually fit that, that budget and their need, etc. So that's where the scoping then has that added dimension of the budget that, that we can discuss with the requesters. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm now in stereo. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you hang on to that. Uh, Carla, are you ready to launch the... Oh, it's there. Just about everything comes out as important. Have you, have you all, yeah, no? Sorry? Is there one missing? Oh, so, ah, I couldn't see that, thank you. Okay, can I, can I open it up to you to, to comment, to, uh, to either raise additional challenges um, 
Isabel, um, and um, and comment so far. Yeah, we've got three over there as well. Isabel, would you like to start? Okay, my name is Isabel Sosa Pinto uh, from the University of Porto, and I, I in Eclipse, I was uh, mostly dealing with the network of networks, how to network people. And this was a challenge because our idea was that there are already a lot of networks of knowledge around. So instead of really connecting to each expert or each uh, knowledge holder, we could connect with the existing networks and have this network of networks. And this has been a challenge because the networks themselves and I also part of networks and uh, it's a challenge to keep a network. So I think uh, we've been thinking a lot how, to how this should evolve. And I think in a way there are all these new mech and new actually technology that can help with that. But uh, it's really understanding how we can do that because in a way a network, and as we know uh, from uh, the existing networks, is a challenge to keep this network going and to keep people interested and to keep people uh, giving inputs and all of that. So if we create another network, we also have uh, these problems. But also working with networks that sometimes don't have uh, also the resources to really interact. This is also uh, a challenge. So I think this will still be a challenge okay. for... Yeah, I agree. So, it, yeah, in, engaging networks is has not been a, a highlight up to now, to, to put it diplomatically, but, it, but I, I agree it's absolutely essential that that you done. The, the gentleman standing up and then Susanna. Well, first of all, um, I think it would be good to know how many of the problems decision makers face can be addressed in this way, which means within a year or a bit more. Secondly, it would be extremely helpful to know how many working hours have been going into each of the challenges which has been answered in the end. So we know that the human resource cost, how high is that? Because without knowing that, nobody has a feeling for the value which has been delivered and nobody has a clear knowledge about how much effort he or she is ordering when asking a question. So before you think about money, I think this kind of data would be necessary. When you begin to think about money, you involve networks also from civil society. For them, it's sometimes really difficult to do paid work, whereas on the other hand, they have limited capacity. That's a so-called participation overkill. They can participate, but they don't have the capacities. What is the models for that? That is the challenges I'm talking about. And then comes the fact that inside science, it's experience with interdisciplinary processes, there is not the objective truth, but there are different points of view. Uh, slightly so in, in even in natural sciences, much more frequent in social sciences. If you have different school in economics, they will conclude completely unreconcilable results from the same data. Uh, even more so in sociology and other social science disciplines. So if you want to deliver, what do you deliver? You haven't explained what you deliver in case where the science is not uh, converging to a certain issue but giving you completely different results. If you involve civil society organizations, they may base their argumentation on a different kind of value system. Stakeholders are diverse and usually conflicting. That means that their results obviously also tend to be conflicting. Their suggestions and their selection of knowledge or at least the attribution of relevance to different pieces of knowledge. So that is a challenge that I see in the real world when working in science policy interface. How do you solve these problems? Question mark. Okay. Uh, Suzanne and then... Thank you. Suzanne de Chavigny again from the Scientific Advisory Group. Um, I'd like to focus on the difficulty of uh, getting civil society in general 
uh, on board. You, you mentioned a few, and you mentioned the cost for them, to CSOs. It's very, very true. Um, that really needs working on. And in particular, uh, there's the question of the European versus national level. I think it's very important that Europe goes to citizens and not ask citizens to come to Brussels in some form or other to, mm -hmm. to discuss. And uh, coming to Brussels is a metaphor for speaking English, for being happy to travel, for whatever you like. So that's really a major issue, and we should think of ways of getting local uh, groups or local meetings to dialogue, but in a very uh, supportive manner. And that's definitely not through uh, electronic systems or, or, or anything like that. There's really something to work on there. Thank you. Per per yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, personally, I'm happy to come to Brussels every week, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm not going to comment further on Brexit or try not to comment further on Brexit. There are lots of people who want to, on the panel that want to speak. Stuart, do you want to have a comment first? And then I'll... Thank you. Um, it's really coming back to um, the previous uh, question from the gentleman just behind me there. Um, I'd like to draw on my experience for Eclipse-type processes which we developed for U UK government. And really to show the, the value of the Eclipse uh, uh, approach. A few years ago, perhaps seven years ago, I was head of evidence strategy for the Department of the Environment, uh, Food and Rural Affairs, and managing a large research program. And it became really clear that a lot of money was being spent on the research, and we became increasingly aware that doing this primary research, there was a lot of secondary, a lot of research already out there, which was um, plentiful, not very easy to find, and would take a long time to summarize. So we spent a few months uh, developing um, rapid evidence review methods, and within a year or so, we were able to deliver twice as many report outputs to answer the policymakers' questions by using evidence review methods, so which is secondary research rather than primary research. We found that our relationship with providing the advice to the policymakers completely changed. The scientists speaking to the policymakers, because you have to have the dialogue, which is part of uh, the eclipse type, type process. And where we, we did find that the evidence was ambiguous, as you say, what may be a problem, that in itself was incredibly valuable. And the final value to us was when we were asked to do uh, briefings, uh, particularly for ministers, they may say, actually, I don't like your results on for example, climate change, I'm going to get a different set of experts and come back with results that suit my needs. And you've got a method, you've got a process, and you can say, if your uh, expert doesn't follow those methods, then you really can't hold it up against what is ours. And the value of having uh, 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 the whole Eclipse system is in incredibly value for lots of people um, in, in, in government, working the policy interface, to be able to look to the Eclipse as, as uh, championing those, those methods. So I would make a strong case that it is very, very cost effective um, from, from my own uh, experience. Thank you very much. I think you first, yeah. Miriam, and then Rania, Rika. Um, just, to, just to follow up on the point about the importance of involving stakeholders. Um, so when, when Eclipse receives a request, um, the scoping process is really important to determine what sort of methods might be appropriate in identifying that, um, in responding to that request. And if we consider that the request needs to draw on stakeholder knowledge, we will suggest participatory processes, which are designed to, take, to, to look at this diversity of opinions that's out there and collate those into, in a transparent way as opposed to typical scientific review processes that draw on technical knowledge. So these processes make use of people's opinions and value systems as well. Thank you. Rania. Thank you. Of course, I, I, just, I wanted to, a quick re reflection to give on, on being on the real world. We know that I am aware, and I think, uh, 